well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak about this um, new, um, as I said, research cluster, um, um, which is primarily concerned with looking at uh, relics. And we define a relic as an object of particular uh, cultural, historical, or religious significance. And of course, often, often those um, uh, those categories can can overlap. So I'm here on behalf of a number of people. Um, and these are researchers mostly based at Keeble College in Oxford, um, at the Advanced Studies Centre as it's known, um, but also um, from other universities such as the University of Copenhagen for our ancient DNA advice. And the idea has been to bring together um, lots of researchers who are working on similar problems, similar themes um, that are related to archaeology and the study of objects, um, but who wouldn't necessarily meet in a, a traditional academic environment, not because they wouldn't want to, just because they wouldn't have the opportunity. And so we physically gathered together everyone in one space and we talk about our research and we talk about um, how we would look at a particular object, so for example a, a religious relic and the different um, aspects that can be uh, applied to that so that you don't just have a scientific description of what this is, how old it is, um, but also incorporate some of the uh, theological and art historical and, and, and aspects of ecclesiastical history, for example, that wouldn't necessarily um, be thought of um, by one individual uh, specialist. Um, and this is just uh, the latest in a series of research clusters we've set up at um, the Keeble Advanced Study Centre. Um, there are several others structured around broad themes. So, for example, um, Lambus Malaforis, who was mentioned earlier, um, is plays a big role in the creativity cluster. Um, uh, and we also have someone at um, medical imaging and um, another on medieval and renaissance studies. Um, and all of these interact, they're not, they're not sort of discrete categories, but it helps to have some kind of structure. Um, so what is a relic? I'll briefly explain that we, we've wrestled with this problem for a long time because it's a very, very broad category. Um, you could almost say that it's kind of, we're, we're the artifact cluster, um, which doesn't really narrow it down. We found that um, objects of particular cultural or historical or religious significance, um, in a lot of our early work, that's um, we, we started in October, so this really is early days. Um, a lot of our early work is focused on religious items, so for example um, relics of John the Baptist, which I'll come on to later, but um, I think it's important that we don't kind of get tied down to this one um, this one area of typecast because there are several other um, interesting uh, royal analyses that could be done um, and are ongoing in the UK and we've got several projects lined up um, for the future. So probably more important than what a relic is is why should we care about them and why should we study them. Um, I'm a medievalist and um, archaeological scientist, so I'm quite interested in the medieval period, particularly the history of Christianity. Um, and there are a number of reasons, which I won't go through all of them, um, why these um, relics are important. But um, this quote I quite like, they were, they were pawns in almost every <coughs> power struggle of medieval Europe. Um, so you find mentions of relics um, being given as gifts um, between kings. Um, they provide a huge amount of income for uh, through pilgrimage for, for for the medieval church and continue to, to do today, I understand, um, as well as the uh, the more obvious spiritual and religious importance of these objects um, and how they were venerated through time. Um, and so they provide a snapshot of not only an anthropological data in the case of biological relics about who that person was and what their life was like, um, but also about trade and exchange, both of um, relics and uh, the the substances associated with them, so for example the, the reliquary in which these are often um, stored, and the residues which are, which are often found on bones. Um, yes, so traditionally um, people used to look at this subject, they've been doing it for uh, <coughs> centuries, um, counting out um, bits of the true cross and working out if it could have been a real, um, a real thing for example. Um, but we're very fortunate nowadays um, that we have especially within the last five to ten years, um, the ability to perform a huge number of scientific analyses on important objects without <laughs> leaving much damage. Um, radiocarbon dating uh, about 20, 30 years ago, um, they would have looked at the situation now where we can take um, a sample of 50 milligrams of bone um, for a radiocarbon date and just said it was impossible. Um, the sample sizes have um, decreased markedly and the same is true for ancient DNA. We can not only um, 
screen out contamination much more effectively, but also get more information from a smaller sample size. So the time to do this is really is really nice now. This, this, it's the first time that it's been really possible on the scale that we're proposing. Um, the same is true for analytical chemistry. Um, as I mentioned, looking at residues and how um, that can teach us about uh, ritual and uh, how and, and religion through time and how the um, objects have been treated through their, their post-mortem life history. Um, so why are we doing this? I've kind of <laughs> got over this already. But, um, so first of all, working out how old is this material? Um, let's say, for example, it's, it's a bone of John the Baptist. How old is this really? Um, when did this individual die? We can establish that through radiocarbon dating. Um, where did they come from? In some cases, churches, at, uh, the church environment actually preserves uh, biomolecular information very well. Um, because we have a stable, more or less cool environment, um, and so that's an exciting aspect of what we're um, what we're able to do now. Um, particularly with mitochondrial data, which is more likely to be preserved, we can work out the haplotype um, to which this individual belonged, um, and from that get an idea of where this individual is coming from. So, are they coming from the Levant? Are they European, or further um, overseas? Um, and also, something I find particularly interesting is seeing if we can link relics together. Is there a part of one individual that ends up in Spain, and another part in Scandinavia, um, and another part in Poland? We can start to address these issues and see um, and that there are important conclusions to draw from that regarding trade, exchange, how these things moved um, through time. Um, which, and we can connect all this to, back to the historical sources um, and see where they, they agree or disagree. Um, so I'll very briefly go through the, the techniques we, uh, we, we use um, in these cases. So this is the one on the right is just an example of a, um, uh, a relic we were looking at in Belgium recently. Um, so of course we have, we have an osteologist on the project who will look at um, what you can tell from, from the bones, so trauma pathology, um, age and sex of this individual, um, also species. Is this actually a, a piece of human bone? We do actually find that sometimes animal bones have been mixed in with a group of human bones to make them um, appear bulkier. Um, and we're also interested in not only um, perimortem damage, so um, injuries sustained at the time of death um, by a saint and how that might um, how that might relate to a historical account of, of their death. A lot of these martyrs um, met pretty gruesome ends. Um, but also the post-mortem life history and trying to work out um, when whether and when um, bones were split into two, because we know this happened. They were they were divided between um, between uh, well, they were divided in two and sent out to various other figures. Um, so we're very fortunate in Oxford to have access to the radiocarbon accelerator unit, um, and this is usually the main kind of analysis. It's what people find most interesting. How how old is this um, is this bone? Is this piece of hair? Uh, or is this wood? Um, and we're well set up to do this um, in Oxford. Also, you'll all be aware of stable isotope analysis and what it can tell us about paleo diet. So we're, um, the f if we have a bone, for example, um, and it's attributed to a saint who was probably vegetarian, were they really vegetarian? We can start to address some of these things. Um, and as I mentioned before, ancient DNA, um, we've teamed up with colleagues from uh, the University of Copenhagen who have um, excellent uh, ancient DNA clean facilities um, and so uh, we've taken a number of samples from relics across Europe and we're currently analyzing them to try and work out um, whether there are any links between them and individually where these people might have come from um, and in some cases of course it's possible to tell hair, eye colour um, and other interesting aspects like that. Um, analytical chemistry um, we'll be looking at uh, the residues on bones um, often these are organic, uh, organic residues um, which are easily um, identifiable by FTIR or um, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Uh, and these, we do have lots of accounts um, and archaeological evidence of people pouring things like wine and, um, and oil over relics and then taking the, um, these substances back, sometimes for medical uses. And so we're going to be looking, hopefully, um, at the uh, the, the chemical composition of these of these objects and what that can tell us about ritual um, 
through time throughout the medieval period and possibly even before then. Um, something I've been playing around with uh, was with uh, 3D photogrammetry. When we travel to these places, I mentioned reliquaries, um, often the, the bone is what we're interested in, but what's important is considering the entire um, the entire structure, if you like. It's almost like an excavation, um, trying to go through very carefully to open a relic um, and record as much as you can. So um, we found that photogrammetry using Agisoft Photoscan, um, which some of you may be aware of, has been a really effective tool of um, preserving ecclesiastical heritage um, because all it requires is a, is a digital camera. You can do the processing off-site. Um, and to do all these analyses, uh, these analyses are, are um, point out again that these sample sizes are incredibly small. Personally I managed to get a, a viable date using 30 milligrams of, of material. We were lucky because there was a lot of collagen preserved but it is, it is becoming increasingly possible with um, advances in accelerator mass spectrometry to make um, to produce dates from very very small samples and of course this has been quite understandably a concern of um, churches and museums um, for the last well several decades since radiocarbon dating was invented, um, the amount of material required to be sacrificed in order to get this information back, and that's constantly reducing. Um, so we're, we're by no means the first people to try and do this. There's a long tradition of using an interdisciplinary approach to um, investigate uh, objects of, of religious significance, relics. So a few examples. Um, Professor Mark van Strydonk at the Brussels Institute of Archaeological Heritage, I think, um, in Belgium, has worked on a lot of uh, local saints in in, um, in shrines and, and tombs around there, um, using <coughs> a combination of techniques including radiocarbon dating and stabilized tip analysis. Um, we've also uh, been in touch with um, Professor Tarot Sainen in Finland, who's done a lot of work in um, Turku Cathedral. Um, and there was a very intensive multidisciplinary study um, that was uh, started for the millennium on uh, relics of St. Luke in Padua. And we're sort of drawing on these um, and using these as a model for, for our, um, our new research unit. Um, <coughs> So Oxford, by virtue of the, the accelerator unit, there's also been a lot of work done in Oxford itself. So the Turin Shroud is probably the most famous one, a bit before my time. Um, but recently we've um, been working on John the Baptist and the True Cross, going around seeing what the connections are between these um, uh, between these artifacts. So very briefly, um, I'm just going to go through some of the current work we've done. Um, it's going to be a very brief overview because we've literally just launched this um, this cluster, but um, hopefully it'll show you the kind of thing that we're we're interested in doing. So all of this, um, the focus on St John the Baptist, uh, which has been a current focus, started through a chance discovery on a Bulgarian island. Um, this is an island called Sveti Ivan, which translates as John uh, St John, um, and it's just off the Black Sea coast of Bulgaria near a place called Sozopol. And they were digging a uh, 4th to 5th century monastery. Um, and under the altar, they found a box with some bones in, um, which was quite interesting. But what was more interesting was that right next to it was an inscription um, mentioning St. John and also um, June the 24th, which is his feast day. And so what the archaeologists think is that this is probably um, some relics that could have come from Constantinople, which is not that far away, um, and then been placed during the foundation of this church in the 4th fifth century um, um, under the altar um, for them to find. So Oxford was asked to radiocarbon date these and a specialist in Copenhagen um, did some DNA analyses. It's quite surprising. It turns out that these bones are actually 1st century and they possess a mitochondrial haplogroup which is very common in the Near East, particularly the area around Syria. Now of course this doesn't prove anything. Um, we, can never, we can never authenticate um, these objects, we can never say this is John the Baptist and that's not what we're trying to do. Um, first of all because it's impossible. Um, you can never, the only sure answer you can get is that this definitely isn't this person. Um, so that got us thinking and we were very interested in seeing um, okay, well that, that that was unexpected, that was a first century find, so um, how old is the other material? We'd always assumed it was medieval, so let's have a look and, and see how old this material is. So this is an example 
of a very well-traveled relic. This was in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, um, in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And this is Professor Tom Hyam um, taking a sample earlier this year. Um, turns out it's 8th century, which is quite, inter quite interesting, earlier than the, the Gulf treasure, um, of which it was once a part before it was split up in the, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so we're really just starting to get a feel of, of how old this stuff is. It's not all medieval, as, as I had assumed, and I think a lot of popular culture assumes. Um, and some of them do have a, an, an older and more interesting history. Often they are very old um, items by the time they come into uh, collections, but that's not necessarily as old as people believed. Um, so this is where I came in. Um, for my MSc, uh, we got some support from National Geographic to go out into Europe um, and sample um, a number of relics attributed to the same saint. Um, so rather than doing individual kind of case studies, um, looking at uh, where uh, relics of John the Baptist were recorded as being, um, um, and then going out and performing as many analyses as we could to try and just get it, start getting some data and work out how old these materials are. Unfortunately, I'm not at liberty <laughs> to, um, to reveal what, um, what the results were, but they were very interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that in the next year um, we'll be able to release them. Um, in fact, we're still waiting for some of the results, some of the analyses, so even if, even if they were ready, I, I couldn't. Um, so just, just to finish off, um, I, personally, I found it um, a very interesting experience going around during the summer and um, visiting all these churches, often in quite remote places, and, and taking samples. I was expecting a very frosty reception, um, because traditionally sci science and faith, if you like, are, are kind of held up as being sort of polar opposites. Um, but I was really pleasantly surprised at how um, excited everyone was to see us and, and that we'd shown an interest in the history of their community. Often relics are nowadays not actively venerated, they're often in somebody's cupboard. Um, and so in some cases we weren't actually able to find the relic because someone had put it away. Um, and so what was really, yeah, um, what was really good was uh, being able to engage with the community like that. And I think it's important that when we're talking about interdisciplinarity, we often assume that it's between academics, and that's often what people mean, I think. But there's also a place, I think, for local groups. So, for example, um, uh, museums is a bad example, but um, within churches, certainly, that um, a lot of the, the, the senior figures within the church are very happy to, um, to contribute, for example, by looking up archival research, which was invaluable for, for our purposes. Um, so in this case we travelled with a conservator, also very important, um, in order to try and um, open up this, this reliquary. This is one from um, southern Belgium. And it gave us an opportunity for him to inspect it for damage, so we've identified um, mould for example, um, and give it a clean. And so this allowed us, we weren't actually able to take a sample on this visit, um, but this allowed us to um, identify where conservation work was needed um, and now we're in the process of trying to get some funding to to make that happen. And so it directly benefits the um, the heritage itself. And um, just a, an interesting thing I thought I'd mention if I had time was that um, you often have unexpected discoveries when you open these things. So uh, written in pencil on the back of this um, this uh, wooden backing that you can see uh, were two inscriptions from the last times that these that this uh, reliquary was opened. Um, one of them being 1937, so it was quite a um, before before the war, of course. So there was it's quite a um, a poignant moment, um, and so what was what we suggested was that they had their own for 2015, um, which they were very excited about. Um, and this I meant I put up before. This is one of the 3D scans of um, of that reliquary, um, which I produced, um, and so. Just to finish off, another aspect of what we've been doing is going to various cathedrals um, in Belgium uh, in particular because a lot of our contacts are there and just seeing what's there really. I mentioned a lot of this stuff is actually in somebody's cupboard. In this case there was a whole wardrobe full of um, cardboard boxes and plastic bags full of material for us to look at. So we did a very brief survey because we had to. Um, this is my, uh, my colleague George Kazan. Um, going through one of the uh, one of the boxes, which contained I think about 300 of these little um, capsuli. Um, often, it's these things are too small to sample, but they're um, they're larger. But the the point is that 
Um, this is a scene that I think is repeated in the cathedrals and churches all across Europe. So there's a lot of material available to study. The challenge is working out the best use of our resources and trying to identify where this material is and whether it's worth testing. So to finish on a positive note, um, we've just managed to secure quite a, a generous donation um, from the H.B. Allen Trust, which is going towards the Advanced Study Centre at Keeper College I mentioned. At the moment, it's, going, it's not a physical entity. It requires a, a bricks and mortar um, foundation, and this is, this is going to be it. So it looks like that dream is becoming reality, so we're very pleased with that. So um, watch this space. So, thank you.